Grab your Bibles and turn with me to the New Testament pastoral epistle named Titus. Uh, You'll find Titus towards the back of your Bible, tucked in just after 2 Timothy, just before the very short letter of Philemon. Uh, Before we jump into the next portion of chapter 2, listen again to the first verse of chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you... Paul says to Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. The Apostle Paul is uh, giving counsel to Titus, who's a pastor in the area of Crete, uh, and is encouraging him, exhorting him, reminding him to teach, to speak what accords with sound doctrine, a a kind of um, living and talking to remind the saints of what is proper, of what is fitting with sound doctrine, with the authority of God's holy word. Those who belong to Christ, we are to live out the truths of God's word to be in accord with sound doctrine. Uh, This is a a beautiful and helpful thing. In the rest of the chapter, we really see him then begin to address some specific areas of life. And so last week we saw... Uh, him address older men in verse 2 and younger men in verse 6 through 8. So men who accord with sound doctrine was our study and focus last week. If you missed that, I'd encourage you to go back to the podcast and grab hold of that message. Spend some time there to understand the context of those things. Uh, Today, we look to what he has to say to the women, the older and younger women in verse 3 through 5, the focus of our text. Brothers, For all you brothers in the room, just as I encouraged the sisters last week, you brothers, uh, this is because we're going to talk about women who accord with sound doctrine. This is not a moment for you to tune out, hey, and nudge your your wife, your daughter, hey, this is for you. Uh, You know, I'm going to think about the game later. No, this is for you too, brothers. Why? So that you can be encouraging the women in your life, leading the women in your life, holding them accountable, praying for them pressing them to these good truths, encouraging them. If you who have daughters, to be raising them up in these good things to help them understand this. We all have important takeaways from God's word every time we're in these things. And so let us be humble today. Let us be uh, looking to the Lord to to speak mightily to us uh, in all the perfect ways that he wants to apply these good things to our lives. All right, let's jump right into our text with so much to cover. Um, Pastor Steve said, uh, you know, halfway through the sermon, first hour, he said, like, I don't even know. I didn't see how you're going to get to the end. Praise God we did. Let's see if we can do it again. Uh, Just these three verses, Titus chapter 2, 3 through 5. Here it is in its entirety. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good And to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, to be working at home, to be kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Much to cover. Paul jumps right in to speak of older women that are in accord with sound doctrine here in the opening of verse 3. Like the older men, older women, church, should be given respect. Respect for the seasons of life that they've lived and the age that they're now at. This is seen really in the most fundamental workings of creation as the Lord was clear to command that children are to honor both father and mother. Right? We're not just to honor the patriarchs, we're, we're to honor our mothers. We're to honor the, the, the women in our lives. Paul's letter to Timothy chapter 5, he says that we are to encourage and respect older women as mothers, like mothers, in a genuine way, okay? The New Testament, in those times, older women served in many important ways in the church and in the community. Uh, We'll see this in this passage play out, uh, but... Much of what that is was to be a mentor and a discipler of younger women. Uh, They had an important ministry we see in the New Testament to each other as well. Uh, Women of all ages in the church. Uh, The older women in the New Testament we see played an important role in visitation of the sick. uh, And in those in need, uh, even those in prison. 
They provided hospitality in their homes for other Christians and for traveling missionaries. Uh, I'm thankful for the many ways the older women at Disciples Church have aimed to remain active in ministry, to not pull back and slip into a retirement-like mode, but to look to be full of ways of caring for others and serving others. You ladies play an important role in the life of this church until the Lord calls you home. May it continue to be so. Um, when speaking of older women, Paul continues now his emphasis of what it looks like to be in accord with sound doctrine. So let's look at these one by one. Older women that accord with sound doctrine are to be, first he says, reverent in behavior. Right? The Greek word Paul uses here is unique to the New Testament writings, but it is to convey holiness. That, that they have a reverent devotion to what honors God. Older women who are mature in Christ, therefore have identified the trappings of the flesh. And it's not that they don't still struggle at times with these things, but they've learned in their maturity to struggle less with them. It's because they abide in Christ, because sanctification's been at work, and they want to glorify God. That really is the driving priority. One of the sweet markers of sanctification is to be less entertained or enticed by the longings of your fleshly youth. Right, The things that when you were young, you were so enticed by and tempted to participate in, now you've learned to avoid those things, to keep a greater distance from them, not to be on the edge. The things you were once baited to, to participate in or be a part of, they don't lure you like they used to, largely because you're wiser and you want to honor the Lord. Do older women still have emotions and fleshly struggles? Absolutely. But they have found a way to be abiding in the Lord so that they don't give in to those like they once did. Praise God for those who are older and paving the way, modeling reverent behavior. We all need people to look up to. May we grow in the Lord in these things. I commend you to the words of Paul. He points this to this well in Philippians 4, 8 through 9, when he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Much like the way a mature Paul is saying this to those he's writing to, ladies, much of this is hopefully our model of reverent behavior for those that are watching us um, in the Lord. May it be so. Second, older women that accord with sound doctrine are not slanderers. Right To slander is to speak what is false about another in such a way that is damaging to that person's testimony or reputation. Uh, to slander is essentially to lie. It is to lie about another person. This is forbidden in God's holy and universal law, right? Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This was a real way that our sin, church, was at work in all of us before we were saved. God's word is clear to diagnose that. In Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, doing what? Speaking lies. Right? But for those who have put on Christ, those who are maturing in Christ, an older woman who loves and serves the Lord is one who does not slander others. She doesn't want the fleshly gain that she's tempted to have at the expense of another. So she just, she just keeps her mouth quiet. She sees God's good call on her to watch her tongue, 
to, to represent people rightly, right? To have righteous judgment and, and to not speak before things are understood. She sees God's good call on her to watch her tongue and to, to be gentle and quiet in her demeanor. She doesn't spin up tales that benefit her but tear down others. When instructing Timothy on the qualifications for a deacon, uh, the other titled office in the church, you have elders and deacons, he speaks of uh, qualifications that not just the deacons, the men are to have, but also there's a number of qualifications their wives are to have. And we see that in verse 11, 1 Timothy 3.11. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. She must not be a slanderer, church. She must be a truth-teller, not one who accuses others falsely. Uh, this also means a mature woman in Christ is not interested in listening to slander. She doesn't want to entertain juicy stories about others and be in the know of all the things. No, a more mature woman in Christ is even willing to do something that women really struggle to do, which is even among a circle of women, be willing to raise a hand or stand up and say, we shouldn't be talking about this, right? This malicious words of another should not be in our mouths. Let's, let's repent of that and do something different. So there's an accountability she wants to bring to those that she runs with. The older woman who accord with sound doctrine is mindful to what she speaks. This is an important attribute of a mature woman in Christ, especially, church, this is big words in Matthew 12, 36, that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Before we move on, recognize with me the Greek word that Paul uses here for slander. It's serious, it's diabolos. It's the same word used to speak of Satan as the father of lies. Jesus uses this word as the title of Satan in John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. That Greek word there, devil, is diabolos, slanderer. And you will do your father's desires, he says, to these who are lost and walking in wicked ways. Jesus says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So slander is serious sin. We must do business with it. Ladies, if there's any temptation to slander, any perceived self-benefit that you might gain from it, God's word is clear to instruct us who belong to Christ. Ephesians 4.25 Having put away falsehood, right? That was the old self before Christ. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Colossians 3.8, but now you must put them all away. Put what away? Anger, wrath, malice, malice in our hearts towards one another, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. These are not fitting for older women who are mature in Christ. They're not, it's not fitting for any of us who belong to Christ. So may we heed that well. Older women that accord with sound doctrine next, he says, are not to be slaves to too much wine. Okay, not to be slaves to too much wine. Not to be slanders or slaves to too much wine. Paul is speaking of... A maturity that means a discipline in life, which means a proper handling of God's creation. These mature women have learned in Christ to steward the things of life in God-honoring ways. Right? So there, there's layers to the sin that Paul's mentioning here. So let's pull it apart and see both sides of this. A mature woman in Christ are not to be part of, first, the sin of too much wine. Right? Also known as drunkenness. God's word is clear that we are not to get drunk. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Those who are fleshly or immature uh, or are given to the world's ways has, have often embraced vices, lifestyles, where they indulge themselves sinfully. Uh, and so this might be a lifestyle whereby one lives 
for the weekend so they can party. Or maybe there's a nightly pursuit of pursuing alcohol, not in moderation, not to God's glory, but to get numb, right? To, to be medicated by it, to medicate themselves with alcohol in an effort to find comfort or escape. But church, we should not look to creation to find comfort, but to our Lord himself, who is the great comforter in our lives. We who belong to Christ, we live for the glory of God. We too look forward to the weekend greatly, but not to get drunk or to indulge in the world, but so that we can enjoy Sabbath, Sabbath rest, Sabbath worship to gather with our adopted brothers and sisters and to worship the one true and eternal God. Amen? Older women are to not be slaves to too much wine. Right? Older women who accord with sound doctrine are not only to avoid overindulgence of alcohol, they are also not to be enslaved to it. It's one thing to drink too much. That's drunkenness. It's another thing to long for it or to need it in such a way that you have to have it, thereby are potentially enslaved to it, right? It has a master-like effect in your life. To be given to it in such a way that it owns you begins to show signs that you are enslaved to it. This is not a marker of a woman who is controlled by the Spirit and faithfully committed to Christ alone. Sisters, this is a serious thing, and it's of the utmost importance that you are aware of the things your flesh longs for in an uncontrolled way. One of the great ways to test this is to commit with accountability to a season to go in without that thing and see how you function, see if you're undone and scratching and, and not functioning right because of, of an enslavement to it, to reveal an overgrip on it, that you're ornery or mean or complaining or constantly speaking about it in a way that it shows it owns you, in a way that you've given too much of yourself to it. These are important areas to see. Notice with me that Paul is clear to say that they are not to be slaves to too much wine. He is not saying something that sometimes people have wrongly understood about Scripture, that they are not to have wine. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God gave wine to gladden the heart of men. It's a good gift. Psalm 104, 15. And like many other good gifts in creation, we need to be aware of misstewarding them unto overindulgence, gluttony, drunkenness, and or addiction. Right, Taking a good thing, allowing it to become an ultimate thing, allowing it to become a vice in our lives. The gospel in our life means we are no longer enslaved to anything but Christ. Amen? The key is that we live out this gospel truth by being satisfied in Christ in all things and not looking to anything or anyone else to complete us or fulfill us. May it be so because of Christ at work in us. Next, we see that older women that are in accord with sound doctrine are to teach what is good. To teach what is good is to pass on the wisdom and the truths of the Lord who is good. Ladies, see with me that this is a direct link to the commandment of the Lord Jesus in his giving of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right here. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age to teach, to pass on the rich and life-changing truths of God that we've received in his word, that we've come to know through the salvation we found in Christ. 
there's an important task that every generation takes most seriously, and that is to continue to live out the Great Commission until he takes us home, until he calls it done. And part of that is teaching, passing on God's truths. The key part of this is to teach the good truths that God's given us. And as we do this, we can be confident that his word will not return void, that God will do what he intends it to do in the hearers. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. This is God's word. Christian, church, what we're studying today is God's word. This is not a sermon. These are not... These are not instructions that you may take or leave. You are to heed them, honor them, or you revile God. All scriptures breathed out by God and is profitable, is going to do these things for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Ladies, you are to teach what God has shown you in his truths to those appropriately in your wake, right? Your own children and grandchildren, other women within the church, younger women who need to know God's word. They need to have it modeled for them. They need to have it taught to them. That is what Paul specifically instructs the older women to do next. Older women that accord with sound doctrine are to train the younger women, right? They are to teach what is good and so train the younger women, the young women. Training is essential. It is essentially discipleship. Discipleship is such a key part of what makes the church continue generation after generation. For if we don't disciple the next generation and raise them up and mature them in the truths of God, who takes the baton from us? Everyone must be trained up in God's truths and discipled to grow in Christ's likeness. No generation gets to say, ah, we'll let the next group handle discipleship. The priority of disciple making is how the more mature believers of the church pour into the newer believers or younger believers of the church. Sometimes this has nothing to do with age, right? What is, what a thought it is that those who are pouring into those who are younger in faith and doctrine will be doing that with many who years from now will be the ones doing that. I mean, I, I love this. I love the history, 134 year history of our church, its impact on this region of the world, the state, the world. And that we, and as Disciples Church, are getting to be part of a generational impact. Now, my deep hope is that to find a solid church where the truths of God are being preached, discipleship is happening, accountability is happening, that we would not just enjoy that and benefit from it for a season and then say, good riddance, I'm going to move on and find something else, but that we would run for many years, decades, and generations together to to truly be part of handing the baton, not only to our kids, but then to their grandkids and beyond. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for our older saints, some of which are in the room in their 80s. I'm going to have, I'm going to have lunch with three of our older saints tomorrow who are, who are 100 years old. And, and praise God for that legacy, that the Lord would allow some of us to be part of this journey for that amount of time and to see generations rise up and knowing the good truths of God and passing them forth. It's a joy to see many of you ladies investing into your own children or into some of our youth here at the church and or into other women in the church and the different ways you're doing that. This is an essential practice that honors the Lord and emboldens the future and the strength of our church and our mission. I love that so many of our ladies gathered yesterday for a time of fellowship and encouragement in the world. word. I heard there was many of you here and pray you were blessed by that time, edified and encouraged by the fellowship. If you missed that, if you found a way to continue to miss that, heed those invitations. Come, even if you're like, I don't really know anyone. That's the purpose of those gatherings. Come and become known and get to know others and 
and hear their stories and know how to start praying for each other. But more than those corporate gatherings, I'm encouraged at how many of you are humbly walking with others in true Christ-empowered unity and discipleship, where you are seeking to know and impart the truths of the Lord. I'd love to see where women who are older in years, but maybe younger or spiritually immature, are willing and humbled to be discipled by a more spiritually mature woman who might be younger in years. That our pride would not get in the way of that, but we would be blessed, we would be encouraged. Uh, it's a sweet testimony of how the gospel is at work. I'd love to see a growing number of our sisters in Christ who are single, who are empty nested, who are retired and or who are widowed, who are finding ways to be active in the church, active in the investment in other women's lives in the different ways you're doing that, to know our moms, to know how you can be helping them in their homes and the raising up of the next generation, to be serving here, to be part of important ministries that are happening throughout the year. Uh, there, there's uh, a gathering of ladies right now in the other room as, as some preparations are being made for VBS just a few months from now. Um, and so praise the Lord for all the ways that we're getting to do this. And so now let's look at, in particular, the ways that Paul is saying the older women are to train the younger women. And in doing so, we really begin to look at the ways a younger woman is in accord with sound doctrine. Look at verse 4 through 5. And so train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Okay? Before we get into the details here, notice a few things with me that Paul, number one, is talking to married women here. Okay, this is not to show disrespect to single women, but his unique focus of this particular teaching is to deal with married women of varied ages uh, in the season that they're in. Ladies, if you're single, you have married women in your lives to encourage in these things, and or maybe in your future one day you might be married, so it's good to understand what these things are that you're being prepared for. Again, much to listen and to understand. To be clear, it's not God's plan that all men and women marry. Some believers he calls to the gift of singleness, as Scripture clearly tells us, and therefore a different focus for life and ministry. Right? Paul says clearly, I wish that many of you would remain single for that very point. So Paul's reference here, though, uniquely is to married women, and he's not just emphasizing, to be clear, the most youthful Right, the young adult ladies or even the young teens. No, no. he's talking about all married women uh, who are kind of outside of that category of, of our eldest women who are just in a whole different season of life. Um, so let's look to these things as it applies to you, those of you who, to who it applies. Uh, women that are in accord with sound doctrine are to love their husbands. A mature woman whom God has called to marriage loves her husband. How? with the selfless love of Christ. That means she doesn't love him for what he does for her. She loves him because Christ first loved her and completed her and satisfied her and her deepest needs. She loves her husband open-handedly, selflessly, sacrificially, for her husband's good and God's glory. Proverbs 31, a faithful God-fearing wife is described this way. In verse 11 and 12, the heart of her husband trust in her and she will have no lack, I'm sorry, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Why does the heart of a husband trust in a faithful and devoted wife? Because she's successful in all that she does? No. Because she's beautiful and so fun to be with? No. It is because she is faithful to wake up each day and fulfill her God-given role to help and follow her husband. To do him good and not harm. 
Not just once in a while, not just sometimes. Ladies, it's not enough that you're faithful to this just some days or in some seasons or in some parts of the month. No, God's word is clear that this is a priority for your daily life. Notice it says she does this all the days of her life. She does this until death concludes the marriage covenant. In this, the more spiritually mature women are teaching and discipling younger women to not be governed by their ambitions or their feelings, but by the Lord. She loves her husband by not harming him or working against his leadership. She's a gentle and quiet spirit She loves her husband by living out the role given to her by the Lord. And she leans on Christ to do it well. I didn't say she loves how her husband leads her or what he decides, right? No, you very well may not like how your husband leads you on many days. But your submission, your faithfulness cannot be linked to his performance or lack thereof. Oh, how failed and broken your marriage will become if based when you base your God-given submission and faithful help on your mood and or his performance. Sisters, see with me God's good word here to shape and sanctify you in this area. Paul is commending Titus to speak of this among the women so that they would be exhorted and encouraged to these things. It's to do that work in you. Ladies, see how desperate you are for Christ, that you would abide in the vine who is Christ, who is life, Anything else you cling to for your hope or happiness is idolatry. Christ in you is the hope of glory. One more quick insight from Proverbs 31 of a faithful God-fearing wife that relates to this. It says in verse 23, Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. The point here about a husband being known among the leaders of the land is less about ego and fame. It's more about the fact that because she is rightly stewarding her household and is a good helper and and submitting well to her husband, the husband is therefore then able to invest himself into the things the Lord has called him to do among the other men. This is similar to the popular saying, behind every good man is a good woman. The blessing of a godly wife frees her husband to thrive in doing what God has entrusted to him. Ladies, this is a good role. This is God's good design for you. To not like this is to make war with his very purpose and design for making you. See how fundamental that is and embrace it as good. If you are a wife, do you humbly see your God-given role to look for all the ways to help your husband to thrive, to, to not cause him harm, right? To, for him to thrive in the things that God has called him to. That your aim is to, is to set him up, to support him, to care for him, and love him well. Again, here, verse 11 and 12 in Proverbs 31, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Ladies, is this you? And if so, praise the Lord for his work in you and through you. What a joy it is to see godly women fighting their sin and their selfishness 
to love and help their husbands for their husband's good and for God's glory. Ladies, this is for your good as well, despite what a lost society is trying to sell you or what what your own flesh is trying to sell you. If this is not you, then how do you press into Christ so that he empowers a different way of living in you so you can live this out? And who might you need to invite in to humbly train or hold you accountable in the ways even that this is being said, that there is a training, a discipling, a modeling. Even if you've been discipled, even if you've gone through some of that, sometimes there is new layers of things unveiled where it's like, I need to be humble to be helped, to ask for counsel, to to be willing to be instructed, to be willing to be admonished by a mature sister or others that could help me in this. Why? Because I long to live in accord with sound doctrine and honor the Lord in these things. Let me remind you, ladies, you're telling the story of Christ in the church in your marriage. So you are needing to model the church's submission to Christ for your daughters and your sisters in Christ and how that is for God's glory. Next, the women that accord with sound doctrine are to love their children. Right? Uh, Women who who need to be discipled so they can then become disciple makers, right? If the Lord ordains to give you kids, then to disciple your kids. A woman who is in accord with sound doctrine loves and leads her children well in the mighty truths of God. This means she gladly invests her time and her emphasis of her days to teaching the good things of the Lord to those that God puts in your life. Back to Proverbs 31, 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Moms, please hear me say clearly. There is no more important role you play in your children's lives than to impress upon them the truths of God. I've seen it firsthand. When done well, much of the best work to speak and teach my children God's mighty truths has not come from their father who is a seasoned preacher and pastor, but from their mother who is faithful to be testifying and teaching God's truths with them day and night. Listen to Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And these words that I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Ladies, this is uniquely and especially true of you as moms because you are the ones who is walking with your children throughout the day. The father is often not there when the children wake. He's early to rise to go to work. He's not there throughout the day like you are to to go on walks and and to talk about these things in the car and at the playground and, and, and in the schooling. Your role of walking in the truths of God in your playing, teaching, discipling your children at home is the most important thing you do for them. Do you realize you could comfort them, love them, protect them, and still fail them if you fail to point them to Christ who is life? Right? Now what becomes of that is up to the Lord. Are we faithful to it? Are we faithful to it with what we've been given? Right? Some of you who are older might look back on seasons in your life and go, man, I so wish I could do this again. You need to be very careful to not be identified by wherever you may have missed in some of this in your past. What you need to do is find your identity whole in Christ to see yourself the way the Holy God sees you in Christ now. And what you need to be do is looking forward to being willing to say, if you missed it back here, at least you're willing to see the miss 
and speak of it differently for the encouragement of others moving forward and to practice it differently moving forward. Okay? The Lord is on the throne of all these things and the timing of these things. It's not for us to take hold of. What have you done with what you've been given? If there's new clarity, understanding in these days, what are you doing with that now and moving forward? That needs to be our focus. Not just for the children in your own home, but the children that the Lord's blessed you in the church family. I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. How are you teaching these truths in the home? Uh, notice in the Deuteronomy 6 passage, you shall write them on their doorpost of your house and on your gates. One of my favorite practices of many of the godly women in our church is the creative ways that you write the words of the living God on your walls, on the spaces of your home, the whiteboards and the chalkboards and the, and the, the picture frames and the refrigerator and all these places. For those of you who don't have children, or maybe your children are grown, the Word of God is clear that your days are to be filled with the care and ministry of many in the family of God. You're not done. Like I said earlier, there, there is no shortage of blood-bought family members who can richly benefit from your love and care for them. May we all be involved in imparting God's good truths to those around us. Ladies, please don't see as your, your home is an empty nest and therefore you're tapped out and done. No, no, no. The Lord has given you a family that is wide and deep, given you an opportunity to have an impact, to be speaking these truths with many who are around you, other women, other children, other grandchildren. Let's not usurp that. Like I've said before, in many ways, this family, your blood-bought family, is more eternally your family than your temporary blood family. So let's not call one better than the, let's not call the blood family better, and therefore, if it's not, then it's not, and I'm, no, I'm tapped out. No, I'm excited to do this well with my blood-bought family as well. May it be so. Younger women that accord with sound doctrine are to be self-controlled. This means they are not given over to their emotions, their feelings, their preferences, or their fleshly desires. The flesh is controlled. The self is reined in. Why? Because the spirit's on board and producing something different. Right? We've talked about this in the last couple of weeks, and so I'll be brief to mention it here, and we'll keep going. If you want a further study of this, look back to the last few sermons. We really look to layers of self-control. Um, self-control means there's sound and sober judgment. Right? You're not getting caught up in drama and, and, and flying off the handle. No, there's a calm, there's a slowing down, Right? There's a steadfastness that Christ gives you that brings stability instead of getting unhinged. Self-control is temperance. It's, it's the virtue of controlling one's desires and passions. It's being sober-minded, mentally and emotionally stable. It's a spirit-empowered reigning in of the flesh so that there's a proper stewardship of your mind and your tongue and your actions. It's a spirit-powered managing of the flesh that keeps it in bounds and controlled. Like I said, if you want to dig further into some of the layers of that, I spoke to it pretty thoroughly in the last couple of weeks, and that's there for you. Let's continue. Women who are in accord with sound doctrine are to be pure. To train the younger women to be pure this is a reference to moral purity, which also includes sexual purity, right? So there's a, a description of modesty here, God honoring modesty. Um, and, and so we see this in some of the other writings, Paul to Timothy in chapter 2, 9 through 10, women should adorn themselves in a respectful apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold and pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. 
Uh, Peter emphasized a similar thing in his first letter, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold, jewelry, the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's eyes. Listen, it, this is not saying don't, don't overly read it. You, you literally can't braid your hair or wear any jewelry. It, it, what he's emphasizing is a woman who really looks for her identity and her value in all of that, right? Ladies, it's that haunting thing when you're in and out of the closet 18 times because you're so consumed at how you look and so worried about how it's gonna come across, right? Um, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. There is a putting away of that because your adorning, your value is, is the Lord at work in you. And, and, and what that's producing, there's a purity, there's a modesty, there's a contentment in Christ that he sees as gorgeous, beautiful, a gentle and quiet spirit. We're going to spend some time with that on Wednesday as we look to the roles of men and women in marriage. This we're in our midweek teaching series, we're right in the part of the catechism that's dealing with marriage, the roles of marriage. So it's kind of fun to see how these sermons are, are running into our teaching on midweek. I pray you would make it a priority to be here with us Wednesday as we dig into those important understandings of the roles in marriage. Um, there's a respectful, humble, quiet, and gentle spirit that's not just an exterior effort but, but it's from your spirit. It's from the way the Lord is at work in you, right? Younger women that accord with sound doctrine, it says, are to be working at home, right? So train the younger women working at home. So Paul's emphasis here is similar to what he says to Timothy. 1 Timothy 5.14, have the younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households and give the adversary no occasion for slander. In God's creating the wife to be her husband's helpmate, God sets the table for the important role the wife carries out in supporting him as he is the one called to provide for the family and to protect the family, right? How does the wife support and help her husband not by taking over the provision or the protection role, but by living out her role well, by working hard at managing the home. Paul's words are clear, in, and, and we see this throughout the teaching of Holy Scripture. A godly wife is a woman who is in accord with sound doctrine. She is busy at home managing her household, not someone else's household, First and foremost, her own children, tending to her own husband. Ladies, I need not spend time on how our modern culture and traditions and even the maybe priorities of our own family, maybe even of your own household, have made war with God's clear priority for a godly woman. And the fact that all of that exists does not change or influence the fact that this is God's good and revealed will for you. The world is reviling God, right? They are dishonoring him by their modes and priorities and practices. We who belong to Christ have to be very careful that we're not buying in to the world's agenda that is about reviling God. But in some of our thinking and priorities and ways of doing life, that's the very thing we've bought into and we're willing to defend. No, instead, Christ in us is to cause us to see God's command and call on us and to embrace it as good and to let it prioritize our lives, even if that means real change. Why? Because Jesus is my Lord. Because I'm committed to serve and to honor him. He's the creator and I'm the created. He gets to set forth the priorities of my life, not my desires, not my traditions. Sisters, it is essential you see your role as homemaker, not as 
some traditional thing from the 50s that we've outgrown. No, see it as the priority God has assigned you and that he calls it good. It should be an honor and a privilege for God to entrust you with a husband to help and a home to manage. I ask you, do you look at it that way? Do you see your God-given priorities as your first things? Church-like submission to your husband's headship is your first priority. And second is the stewardship of the home and the nurturing of the children. Ladies, do you wake up and count these things as true blessings and good God-given priorities for your life? Meaning they come after, they do not come after your personal interest, your hobbies, your desire to earn an income, or any other ministry that might be before you that you count as good and, and, and worthy, maybe even having a great impact. Okay, it doesn't usurp the fact that God has clearly given you priorities to put first. I know that many beloved sisters in Christ have gone to college, have prepared for careers, they've committed themselves to, to other things that they're passionate about. But do you see with me today that no matter how much money you spent or how passionate you personally are about it or even how gifted you are at it, these things cannot come before your good God-given priorities to help your husband and be a devoted homemaker and nurturing mother. Let me remind you that nowhere in Scripture is the wife called to be the breadwinner. Nowhere. Instead, Scripture is clear that she is first and foremost called to be busy at home, tending to her God-given priorities. This is God's design for the family He's given you the first role of helpmate to your husband and manager of the home and nurturer of the children. One of the sweet places we see this modeled well is back to Proverbs 31. Look with me there, verse 10. An excellent wife who can find she is more precious than jewels. Verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Godly, a godly wife works hard, is devoted to whatever is needed to support her husband, to help him thrive in his duties, to help her household thrive, right? To raise the kids in the discipline and truths of the Lord. She's not slothful and excuse-making and lazy. She's definitely not a modern-day, spoiled, self-centered, a real housewife of Orange County, and all the whacked out ways that this has all gotten twisted and celebrated even and, and maybe even sinfully looked at like, wow, how great would it be to, to live that life? No, very opposite. She rises early not because it's about her. It's her joy to fulfill her God-given role and she counts her role as special. She leans in to steward well the day the Lord has entrusted to her. Ladies, if you have a husband, the Lord's given you him today. Don't squander your role to wake early to tend to him. You might not have a husband tomorrow, right? I mean, that is to be a special role until death do you part. And the same with the home to manage and Children to care for if, if still you know, young and in the house. Your aim is to tend to them well what has been entrusted to you. I've heard many people in our modern day critique the wife who's full-time at home to say, oh, man, that was, must be so easy. These people have never met the godly women I know who rise early and work hard all day to keep a well-ordered house, clean house, to cook healthy food for their family, to teach their children the disciplines of life and to educate them well, to be 
energized and ready to greet their husband with joy and care and love when he returns, to be devoted to caring for the members of the church and discipling other women along the way. This job is not easy. No, it is often very hard and taxing. I know I have a very front row seat to see it done. Church, does this mean the Bible says a wife cannot help with breadwinning for the family? Let me be clear. Scripture does not forbid this. So the answer is no. A wife can also work a job, right? And there's definitely seasons where sometimes that's more appropriate, maybe before children, maybe after children, that can be happening. But the Bible is clear that the tending well to your husband and the home and the nurturing and raising of your children is your first priority. That means your job cannot be your priority. Right To rewire that, to reorder that, to redefine, is to redefine what God has clearly defined. And in many years of pastoring, I've seen it put a grossly unneeded burden on many homes. Where a wife is saying, man, I see all this stuff that I'm called to, but I don't have time, I don't have energy left for it. That's because your home is out of order. Right? Now, are there some who do work and still tend well to their first priorities, I believe there are, and praise the Lord for that. I I don't think that's the case for many women, especially young women with children in the home. The working wife who is struggling to help her husband or manage her home or nurture her kids, see that your working is the thing you've added that God did not call you to. And likely the relief you need is to reassess your job commitments. Again, it doesn't matter how much time or money you have into it. We are to know the Lord's will and to do the Lord's will. Husbands, this is also on you as the head of the home and the ways you can permit this to happen or even, for some of you, endorse it to happen. Why? Because you like the extra money it means for nicer things and more vacations. But you need to see it as a usurping of God's design for the good of your home and your marriage. Don't be quick to complain about what she's missing if you're also telling her she's got to work a job. That needs to be addressed. We need to be careful to fight our fleshly desires for more stuff or nicer houses or cars to drive or more vacations to take. Now again, so you don't walk away saying something that I'm not saying. A wife having a job or pursuing a career is not sinful in and of itself. It is sinful if it means you are putting off your God-given priorities of first being a well-focused helpmate to your husband and tending to the children and the home so that the husband can be the primary breadwinner and leader that God has called you to do. I've known many families whose marriages have struggled or whose home has not been in order or whose kids have struggled because the wife is committed to or busy working her job as her first priority. If this is you, my pastoral plea is to allow God's good word to redirect you, to bring good conviction unto change, right? And again, ladies, if you're looking back over, man, I really missed this, do not get caught up in that being Your identity, your identity, your value is in Christ. What you need to do is be a good attentive steward of it now and moving forward in how you speak about it, teach others in it, and then live it out yourself from this day forward. We need to do this, even if it means you have less money, that you drive an older car, that you live in a smaller house, that you travel less, Your kids and your husband will be far more blessed by your daily presence and energy being rightly focused than some extra week in Tahiti. I promise you. I promise you. For those of you who work hard at both your job and your priorities at home and you make it work well unto the Lord and your husband is helped and honored and your kids are well taken care of and your house is well tended to, I praise God. 
that you are doing this well. Praise the Lord. May we heed God's good word and not embrace a system of thinking that reviles it. Next, we are to train the young women to be kind. God's word is clear that we are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in the church forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. The, the English translation here is a kindness not that is just nice, but is useful. Is your selfless love showing kindness that actually is helpful for others, right? When, our, when we were dead in our sin, we, we were selfish. We didn't want to help. We didn't want to make our days about others. But as we grow in Christ, I long to be a blessing to others, to be kind to them. When others look into the church, they need to see a radical kindness, a commitment to helping each other. Is this your practice, right? When you show up at the gathering of the saints, are you actively looking for ways to be useful, to be helpful, to be kind, or are you just coming to consume? This is an important area that we live out. Finally, younger women are to act in accord with sound doctrine. They are to be submissive to their own husbands. We're going to study this pretty thoroughly this Wednesday at midweek, um, and so I'll be brief also for the sake of time. Submission is a fundamental practice of a wife. Why? Because it is absolutely necessary to do if you're going to help the leader, help your husband, right? You don't help him if you're not submitting to his leadership well. It's fundamental, right? God said in creation, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Ladies, submission is the desire and the action to follow your husband's authority and the commitment to respectfully trust and yield to his leadership. Not to redefine that, take over, demand that you say the way it's going to go. No, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So when Paul says to Titus to speak in a consistent teaching reorientation that helps the body of Christ to accord with sound doctrine, he says here at the end that the way we live these things out is so that we would not, so that the word of God would not be reviled. In other words, so that God's word would be trusted and honored and submitted to. We would not be part of the world system, ideology, priorities, that reviles God. We would honor God by submitting to the truths of the word, by doing the very things that sound doctrine calls us to do. Because I belong to Christ, I want to put that on. Paul's point in all of this is not only that we are... Um, not only are the things we do that are wicked and sinful and selfish, but also the good and righteous things that we fail to do is what dishonors God and his word to the watching world. In closing, let me remind you again of Jesus' words to the church in Matthew 5.16. You let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works your living in accord with sound doctrine, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. May the women in our church, older and younger, seek to walk in accord with these things, to live out the days of your life in such a way not to show off your own accomplishments or, or beauty, but the glorious and gracious work of the Lord, that they would see him and say, wonderful, beautiful, and would know him and praise him now and forever. Church, this life is not our own. It's for him. May we steward it well in all we say and do. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this time we had together to, to look to your holy word, to, to slow down our agenda and our thinking and our priorities to, to say, God, you direct me. I am yours. You in, in, instruct me. You show me the way that is good. Lord, I'm thankful for the ways in which you're at work in us. As we aim to study your word faithfully, as it's been my aim to preach it faithfully and to help us think about it 
in accordance with the rest of Scripture and then to apply it, that we would be not hearers only but doers, ones who are walking in accord with sound doctrine, willing to speak of these things in accountability with each other, seeking to honor you in all of it. I'm excited about what is still to come in the ways that you are refining us and growing us. Let us never grow tired of your good work in our lives in these ways, that we're thankful even when it's hard, that we're faithful even when it's costly. We want you to be glorified in all of this. By your grace and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.